Hello, I'm Helen Bradley and welcome to this video tutorial. In this tutorial I'm going to show you how you can process a raw photo in both Photoshop and Photoshop Elements. Now I have Photoshop Elements open here but it could just as easily be Photoshop. I'm going to choose File Open and then navigate to the folder that contains the raw images that I want to work with. I have two of them here and I'm going to select this one here. On the PC if I click on the image then Photoshop Elements is showing me a thumbnail of that image here. On a Mac I'd actually be able to see the thumbnail of the images so I'd be able to determine exactly which image I want to open. I'm just going to click Open. Now in doing so what Photoshop Elements does and what Photoshop would do too is to open the image inside Adobe Camera Raw and this is a version of Adobe Camera Raw. I'm on 7.4 but it hasn't changed a lot in more recent versions. You'll find Adobe Camera Raw for Photoshop has a few more tools than are available in Adobe Camera Raw for Photoshop Elements but we're only going to be using the basic area and the detail panel so that's pretty much the same in both of these applications. The photo is opened inside Adobe Camera Raw because it's just not possible for either Photoshop or Photoshop Elements to handle raw photos. They have to be pre-processed and they have to be pre-processed by a tool like Adobe Camera Raw and this is shipped with both Photoshop and Photoshop Elements and both programs are smart enough to know that if you open a raw image they can't handle them and so they're going to open them automatically for you in Adobe Camera Raw because that's shipped with Photoshop and Photoshop Elements. So to get started you'll be dumped into this basic panel and I'm going to look first of all at the white balance in this photo. Now I have here in this white balance drop down list all the white balance settings that are available on the back of my camera and typically I would use cloudy or shade but none of these are working for this particular image so I'm going to have a look at daylight which is a bit blue and auto which I think is pretty good for this image so I think I'm going to leave it at auto for now but I could if I wanted to manually adjust the temperature. I can drag to the left on the temperature slider here to make the image cooler by adding blue to it or drag to the left to add yellow to it which makes it look warmer. The tint slider allows me to adjust green and magenta. If I drag to the left I'm going to add green to the image removing magenta from it because these two colors complement each other. And then if I add magenta I'm going to be removing green. But let's just go back to auto for now. There's also a white balance tool here so I can click on the white balance tool and then I can click on a place in the image that contains something which in real life would have been neutral grey. Now it's a little hard to remember exactly what might have been neutral grey because that wasn't what I was looking for when I was taking this shot but I can sort of punt that this part of the Millennium Bridge possibly was so I can click on it and when I do the Adobe Camera Raw engine is going to try and adjust the image to make this point neutral and I can sample other areas of the image so I could go down here and say well maybe that was supposed to be grey or maybe this concrete pylon or I could go here. I'm looking at areas which might be black, white or neutral grey and if any of them give me a good fix then I'm going to call it good. If they don't I can just keep on clicking until I find something that does work for me or simply go back to my auto adjustment. I'm thinking right now that that's probably a little bit warm so I'm just going to cool it down a little bit by dragging the temperature slider towards blue. Having done that I'm now ready to look at exposure and from the histogram here I'm seeing that this image is probably a little bit underexposed. So I'm just going to crank it up a little bit and I'm just sort of doing this to taste. So I'm thinking about mm, nearly three quarters of a stop of extra exposure is going to help this image. And then contrast is going to allow me to add more contrast to the image dragging to the right adds contrast to the left removes it. You can see that that's having an effect on the histogram here. Less contrast squeezes the histogram up so everything's sort of more towards the mid-tones. More contrast is spreading out that tonal range. It's actually 
adding a little bit of lightness to the image, which is why I didn't go all the way on exposure because I know from experience that if I add contrast, I'm actually going to push the lighter areas of the image even lighter. And so I don't want to add too much exposure or else I'm going to start blowing out highlights. Talking about highlights, next thing I'm going to do is adjust the highlight areas of the image. That's not the pure white areas, but it's the sort of next to lightest areas in the image. Drag to the right to lighten them, drag to the left to darken them. And typically I would go to the left, but I'm actually thinking for this image I might go to the right because I'd like to see some pores a little bit lighter than it is. And this is the area that's really encompassing the highlights are actually part of this St. Paul's Cathedral building. Now shadows, this allows me to either send detail back into the shadows, darken up the shadow areas of the image, which are these sort of next to dark areas, or I can increase their lightness and bring detail out of the shadows. Now there's some shadow detail here in the Millennium Bridge. Just thinking if I open up the shadows, I can get some of that detail back. And now that's starting to show us some of the bridge detail. So I'm going to do that for this image. But again, it's a creative decision that you make. Now for whites, I want to see if I've got any white pixels and just test the image. So I'm going to hold down Alt, which is Option on the Mac, and just click. And anywhere that I'm seeing any colored pixels here, it's where the whites are in the image. Now I've got quite a bit of whites in the image and probably too much. So I'm going to back these off a little bit. I can also affect the whites by either adjusting my exposure back or my highlights will affect it a little bit. So too will contrast, but I'm going to just back off exposure a little bit and let's go and have another look at the whites. Well, that hasn't really dealt with them, but I'm thinking that for this image that's probably about the best that I'll be able to do. For blacks, I want to do the same thing. Hold the Alt or Option key and let's just test the blacks. Well, any colored pixels that we see now on this white background are black pixels. And so we've got a bit of black in this area. I think I'd like a little bit more, so I'm just going to adjust the blacks down a little bit just to bring back in a little bit more of this black detail. I prefer to set a little bit more in the way of blacks and a little bit less in the way of whites. So once I've got a good choice there, I'm just going to let go of the Alt or Option key and then let go of the mouse button. And this is the adjustment so far. Now we can test and see how far we've come by clicking the preview on and off. This is the before and this is the after. You can see there's a lot more detail through this image, but there's still more to come because the clarity slider here lets us adjust the mid-tone contrast in the image. Mid-tone contrast is this area here and by adjusting clarity in a positive direction, we're going to add some contrast in the mid-tones in the image, which is going to make these areas a lot more crisp, these sort of mid-tone areas and this area of the histogram has been stretched out a little bit more. If we went in the opposite direction, then we'd be squeezing everything up and the contrast would be flattened a little bit. The image is going to be a bit softer. Really good for portraits, negative clarity, and particularly for women and babies. But for buildings like this, positive clarity is going to work a whole lot better. Vibrance is under saturated colors. So right now I'm seeing a few saturated colors in this orange here and this blue in the sign here. But there are some under saturated colors here in this barge that's being towed up the Thames and this roof here in particular will benefit from some increased vibrance. So I'm just going to drag on the vibrance slider to increase the vibrance or the brightness and intensity of those colors. That's helped it a little bit, but so too will saturation. I'm just going to boost that a little bit. I'm thinking my exposure is a little bit down, so I'm just going to increase that a little bit just to lighten up the image. Now having dealt with this panel here, let's go to the before and after. Then what we need to do next is to go to the detail panel because that allows us to sharpen the image. Raw images are not sharpened in the camera, so you will always have to apply some level of sharpening to your raw images. And I prefer to do that in Adobe Camera Raw than in Photoshop or in Photoshop Elements because the tool here is just so much better. 
Now to start off with, I'm just going to ramp sharpening all the way up and I'm going to look at the image at 100% because that's how you should look at sharpening. I'm holding the space bar as I drag on the image because I want to see the portion of the image that I'm sharpening here in front of me. Now I'm going back to using the Alt and Option key. So I'm going to hold the Alt or Option key and just drag on this radius slider because I'm looking at where the halos are being applied to the image and I need to find a sweet spot for these halos. And 3.0 is just way too much. I want to just see the beginnings of halos. And this image is pretty sharp actually out of the camera so it's pretty much in focus. I nailed this one pretty well. So I'm thinking that somewhere between 0.5 and 1.0 is a good area for the radius. If your image is sharp then 0.5 to 1.0 is a good value. If your image is not tack sharp then you'll want to wind your radius up a whole lot more. Now typically the balance I look at for between radius and detail is that they're in a sort of diagonal line. So if I go low on radius, which is what I've done here, then I'll generally want to go higher on detail. And if I went higher on radius, then I generally go lower on detail. Let's just hold the Alt or Option key down and see what we're seeing. Now here we're looking at the effect of those halos. So I'm just looking for a good result here. And I'm thinking that probably a detail setting around 19 is good. If I go all the way, you can see that this is absolutely awful. There's a whole lot of noisy data in that image that is going to be sharpened. But here for detail, I want a fairly low value. I just want to see the very edges. So I'm going to call 18 good for this image. And then I'm going to look at masking because what masking allows me to do is to say, okay, well, I'm going to apply sharpening at this high level, but I only want it to be applied to the very edges in the image. So let's just zoom out for a minute so that we can see the whole image as I'm adjusting this masking slider. And again, I'm going to hold Alt or Option and just drag on the slider. Now, at the far left, the image is white and that's telling me that absolutely everything is being sharpened. But as I drag it to the right, you can see that areas of the image are becoming black. And that's telling me that sharpening is not going to be applied to the image in the black area. So for a start, I don't want to sharpen the sky because that's nice, smooth, puffy clouds. And there are areas of these buildings that perhaps I don't want to sharpen either. So I'm just looking for a sweet point. And typically for a cityscape like this, somewhere around 70 to 80 is probably the best point for sharpening. And for this, probably around 78 because I don't want to over sharpen the water. So I'm just going to let go of this and then I'm going to walk my amount back down to an acceptable level. And somewhere between sort of 70 and 100 is probably the better range for sharpening of this image. Now when I was in this image having a look up close, I could see a lot of noise. I'm thinking that probably 200% will show us the noise and you can just see the noise in this image. And I'm thinking that the luminance noise slider here might let me reduce some of that noise in the image. Now noise reduction is always a compromise because what's going to happen when you reduce noise is that you're going to kill the sharpness of the image and you're going to lose some detail. So you don't want to say, well, you know, 10 was good, so maybe let's just crank it up to 20 and call that even better. It's not going to be like that because going to 20 will start to compromise the image. So what I want to do with this slider is find the best point for reducing noise, which doesn't also destroy the remainder of the image. And I'm thinking like probably around 10 to 12 is pretty good for this image. I can also adjust the luminance detail and luminance contrast sliders to see if they give me better results. They will help adjust the setting, but any time that you take either detail or contrast to the right, you're starting to bring some elements of noise back into the image. So the lower these values can be, the better. You'll find that color for raw images is always set at 25 and that's a pretty good value for removing or reducing color noise in the image. Let's just take that all the way to zero and let's just zoom into 300% because you can see really clearly the color noise in this image. This is a gray blue tower or 
dome on St Paul's and right now it's blue and pink and green and purple. This is color noise. But if I take this up to the default setting which is 25 and I can set that by just double clicking on the slider and it will go to where it is set by default, you can see that that color noise has been reduced. Now Lightroom is going to do that automatically for you. It's set so that color noise most of the time will be removed using the default setting so you don't actually have to do anything to it at all. So there is the image as we have it right now. The last thing I'm going to do is straighten it because it's not straight. So I'm going to just click on the straighten tool here and I'm going to drag over something which should be straight which is this element of the walkway along the Thames. And now you can see that this sort of crop rectangle has been applied around the image and that will be straight when I take it into Photoshop Elements. This is why I don't straighten it before I start because the cropping tool in Adobe Camera Raw just doesn't crop, it just shows me what it's going to look like and I just find this a little bit distracting. But this is all done now. So if I'm finished with the image and I just want to go on to the next image in Adobe Camera Raw, I can just click Done. If I want to open the image and do something more with it inside Photoshop Elements or Photoshop, I can do so by just clicking Open Image. Let's do that right now. So here is the completed image inside Photoshop Elements and it's now in a state that I can do anything with it that I could do with photos inside Photoshop Elements. It's ready for working with because it has been pre-processed in Adobe Camera Raw. When I come to save this image, even though it is a DNG image, that's not going to be an option for saving it. When I choose File Save, I'm going to have to choose something like Photoshop's PSD format or JPEG if I want to send it to the web because these formats are available and of course we can't write back onto the original RAW file whether it be DNG or PEF or NEF or whatever format you're using. For this image, I'm just going to save it as a JPEG so I'll click on JPEG. I'm going to set its color profile to sRGB because that's perfect for the web. I don't want to include it in Photoshop Elements Organizer but it's just going to be given this name and this extension so everything's looking good here. I'll click Save. Because it is a JPEG image I also have to set the quality and file size options here. So quality of 12 will give me best quality but a huge file. I'm quite happy if it's going to the web for just a high setting. That's a pretty good size for sharing and for the web. So I'll just click OK. This image is now saved. So this process would be the same in Photoshop or Photoshop Elements when you're processing a raw image and you want to work on it in Photoshop Elements. You'll have to bring it in via Camera Raw but the application is going to make it easy for you because it's going to automatically open the image ready for you to start working in Adobe Camera Raw. And I suggest because Adobe Camera Raw is such a powerful tool and it's so easy to use that you consider doing all your processing in that application because it's way easier than working on your photos in Photoshop or in Photoshop Elements. I'm Helen Bradley. Thank you for joining me for this video tutorial. Look out for more video tutorials here on my YouTube channel. And consider subscribing to my channel and you'll be alerted when new videos are released. And visit my website at projectwoman.com where you'll find more tips, tricks and tutorials on a range of applications including Photoshop, Lightroom, Illustrator and a whole lot more.